Today we're going to talk to you about Cat Herds Crick, which is a tool that we've um, found to help us with this problem of trying to get all of our different language drivers, cats as you will, who like to wander in different directions to kind of join together in a path that makes sense. And who are we? So I'm, I'm Samantha Ritter. Um, I am an engineer at MongoDB at SAMU Codes. This is my colleague Jesse Davis, also an engineer at MongoDB, Jesse J. U. Davis. And I'm just going to go over the agenda for our talk today. So we're going to begin with a problem, a specific problem that we've had in our process of developing drivers and enforcing specs. Then talk a bit about why this problem lingered, lingered as long as it did. We're going to go over some of our failed attempts to fix the problem. And ultimately, our solution that we found that is working for us so far. Why that solution works. And finally, the payoff that we've had from that solution. And it's going to be my pleasure to share with you the solution side of the story. But before that, I'm going to let Jesse take you back a bit through the dark past and lead you through the long night before we found our dawn. So. Thanks, Sam. Um, right, so we work for MongoDB. It's a open source database. It's written in C++. Um, and uh, it's a remote database server, much the same way that like Postgres or MySQL is. Um, although in our case, we are a NoSQL database. So we have our own data model and our own query language. Um, but we're not going to talk really about the server today. We're going to talk about the MongoDB drivers. So if you have a MongoDB server and you want to connect to it with your application, then you need some client library to talk to MongoDB. And we call that the driver. And the driver has two sides of communication. It's got its API, so the data structures, the functions, methods, and classes that your application uses to do operations on MongoDB. And then also the driver talks to MongoDB uh, over the network using a wire protocol that it talks to MongoDB with, with um, TCP. So this is kind of the basic stack. And whatever language you write your application in, you need to have this stack available so that you can use MongoDB from your programming language. Now, internally, we've implemented MongoDB drivers in about 10 different programming languages. And even within some of these programming languages, we have a few variations, like a synchronous or an async version, or a C++11 and a C++ legacy version. And pretty much, these drivers don't share any code. They are essentially total rewrites of the same idea, the same kind of API, the same algorithms and wire protocol from scratch each time in each programming language. And then as each of these drivers is released, they then have to be maintained indefinitely as MongoDB evolves and adds features that require driver support or as bugs are reported and so on. And this isn't even the end of it. There is also this whole open source community around MongoDB that tackles driver development in newer languages and more exotic languages. And again, they essentially share no code with each other or with us. They are rewrites of the same API and the same idea over and over and over again. And this list may not even be complete because sometimes we discover drivers in the world that we didn't even know about that are connected to our product, but they didn't talk to us. So we've got possibly as many as 20 different programming languages, all implementing the same basic stack. Now, there's a gigantic advantage to this, which is that pretty much any programming language that you might reasonably be using has a MongoDB driver. But there's also a gigantic disadvantage to this. I mean, besides just like a huge amount of effort, there are also differences among them. And here I'm not really, there are bugs. Um, but I'm not really talking about bugs. I'm talking about reasonable choices that people have made differently. And where we didn't intend to vary, but we ended up diverging. 
and we don't know what the variations are. So I'm going to give you an example of a particular MongoDB feature that every driver has implemented, but in a lot of cases, we um, came up with two different interpretations, and some drivers went one way and some drivers went another. So let's say that you have a driver and it's running on some computer on the network. And you have two MongoDB servers. So you can um, deploy MongoDB servers as a set of cooperating servers. These are called a replica set. And they have a um, shared uh, replica, replicated copy of the data. And that means that you can read from either of them um, and balance your query load this way. So the feature that we wanted to implement was called local threshold. And the idea is that the driver, it measures its round trip time to each of the servers, just as a very simple command, it measures how long it takes. And it's supposed to write down its round trip time to the nearest server, and then add 15 milliseconds to that number, and load balance randomly among all of the servers within that threshold. So in this case, that would be a 25 millisecond radius. Any server whose round trip time is less than or equal to 25 milliseconds should be equally eligible for a read. So that's what we specified as the meaning of this feature. But that's not what a fraction of the drivers implemented. A lot of people just saw 15 milliseconds and they came up with this misinterpretation, which is I read from either the fastest server or any server absolutely 15 milliseconds or less from me. So with this misinterpretation of what the 15 milliseconds is for, this idea that it's an absolute round trip rather than a relative to the nearest, that means that this far server is excluded from load balancing and only the 10 millisecond server is read from. And maybe a quarter or a third of all of the drivers misinterpreted the spec in this way. It was very common, very easy mistake to make. And it had two consequences. So one is just that you didn't get the feature that we designed. You didn't get this compromise between low latency and load balancing. All you got was low latency under many circumstances. So you might reasonably argue that that was as good a choice as the choice that we made. Really, the problem with this is that you install a driver and you don't know which interpretation its author implemented. And we're an open source company. We make a lot of money off support because we don't sell the product itself. Um, in that sense, we're like Red Hat and a number of other open source companies. And, uh, when a customer called us, called our support team, and said, I installed this driver, I wrote this code, I expected load balancing, but all I got was the nearest server getting slammed with all my queries. This was very frustrating for the support team because then they had to go to the author and say, which way did you implement this spec? Right? There was no one place where it was written down how a MongoDB driver ought to act. So it's not because we didn't write it down. I actually wrote it down. This is my feature. This is why this is so annoying to me. <laughs> I wrote the thing that everybody got, right? This is simple. Figure out which server is nearest by comparing all the round trip times. And then choose a member randomly from those at most 15 milliseconds farther than the nearest. <laughs> Seems totally clear, right? But I guess that people didn't read to the bottom. Uh, and you can see why maybe not. Like, uh, writing code is fun. Reading English is boring. Um, and uh, a lot of drivers ended up with this hidden variation that lasted for months, uh, or in at least one case that I know of, more than a year before anybody even knew that they weren't up to spec. So. Why? why? Why did this variation, why did these hidden unintentional differences last for so long? There are 
maybe three-ish causes that I can think of. Um, one is just that I was unable or unwilling to read 10 or 20 implementations of this spec over time as each one was completed. Um, I don't know 20 programming languages. Um, and also, I don't want to make a career of reading and working with the authors of 20 different drivers just to make sure that this one idea that I had is properly copied among all of these programming languages. And um, there isn't enough money to pay people to verify each of these features in that kind of detail. Um, besides which, even if I could, uh, I'm not everybody's boss. Um, and even though my boss is the director of the driver team at MongoDB, it's not really our style internally as a company to point at people's code and say, you did this wrong, you need to change it so that it matches this other, guy, this other person's code. Um, at a more proprietary company, it, that might actually be a completely reasonable approach um, to verify people's code and tell them it's wrong. But we uh, have a relatively flat, non-hierarchical open source vibe, even internally within the company. And a lot of the projects that uh, we work on, that we own, began outside of MongoDB and then were brought in-house. So they've got this history that's prior to us, and it's not as clear that we have the authority to say this code is wrong and you need to change it. Um, and that's even more true of the 15, 20 plus drivers that are contributed to us from our community. We have no authority whatsoever to say that code is wrong we can make the effort to describe why we think it would be better if all of the drivers acted the same. But at the end of the day, it's the author's code, not ours. So we did try to fix it, though. These problems aren't completely insurmountable. We, we, we tried really hard to fix them. And we came up with a bunch of attempts, all of which failed for a number of reasons. So, as you saw, I just tried to write really, really clearly in English how my feature should work. And everybody who specified a feature tried to write really, really clearly how it works. And we saw why that's not enough. Uh, it's unverifiable. It's too easy to misinterpret. So if English is easy to misinterpret, then the obvious next step is uh, abandon English and write code. So that's what I did. I wrote a reference implementation. I wrote it in Python, because that's what I was most familiar with at the time. And here it is. And I think it's unambiguous. It says, if you have a list of servers and you want to choose a member, then you should calculate the best ping time as the minimum of all the known round trip times. Then you filter them by whichever one well, you exclude the ones whose ping times are more than 15 milliseconds greater than the best. You include all those whose ping time is less than or equal to 15 milliseconds greater than the best. And then you load balance randomly among whoever's left. Right, so this is really clear, and you could even write a test of this, because this is actually executable Python. But it still doesn't work because it doesn't prove that every other language implementation also matches it. It's just as hard to read a reference implementation in code as it is to read a description in English. So even though we had this, yet varying implementations lingered on. So I could write tests. I could tell people, you should implement the following test. Given servers with ping times 10 to 20 milliseconds, you should load balance equally among them. But again, I haven't proven that everybody implemented the test at all, much less that they implemented it correctly in pass. And even worse than that, like this is actually, this is a solid step in the right direction. I don't want to belittle the idea of writing tests in prose. But the main problem with this is maintainability. Over time, the specification may evolve and improve. We may find problems with it or add improvements to it. We can communicate those by adding new tests or updating existing ones. But there's a lag, and there's no way to prove that a driver has updated its tests in Java or Python or Haskell 
to match the new tests in English. You can't do that automatically. You have to read it. And again, there isn't enough time in the world for one person to read 20 test suites in 20 programming languages. So this also failed. The answer, obviously, is to automate. And we automated with a tool called Cucumber. And this is the closest that we got. This was actually a step in the right direction. So Cucumber, it's this um, behavior-driven development uh, framework. Um, and it's kind of, I, I feel like it was designed for contractors to show to uh, clients and say, do we agree that this is what I'm going to implement? And that the client can read it because it's sort of written in English, and the client can say yes. And then the programmer can write a um, algorithm that uh, meets the test and, and then say, I have written what we agreed that I would write. Um, so it looks something like this. I'll, I'll give you a moment to uh, skim this. So to my eyes, at least, the syntax a little funky. Um, Cucumber tests features with names. So this, this feature is local threshold. And it's got this kind of stylized preamble. It says, in order to do something as somebody with some role, I want to do something. Uh, I, I feel like as a driver author is sort of weird and indicates that we're not using this tool for the job it was intended. Um, all of them said, I want to verify driver behavior. Uh, and then we've got test scenarios for this feature. So this one is the one we were talking about. We've got two nodes at latency is 10 and 20 milliseconds. And there's some data that's been written to all the nodes so we can test the driver by querying for that data. And the driver is somehow supposed to track its latency, its round trip time to all of these servers, and load balance evenly among them. So again, it's unambiguous, and it's sort of automated. And the way you would automate it is you actually write a pattern matcher. So you write a pattern that matches given a replica set with n nodes. And then you write code that responds to that match by pulling the n number out and saying, oh, it's two. I need to simulate or set up a replica set with two nodes. Then you match the next pattern, and you somehow simulate a node with a 10 millisecond latency, and on and on and on. You write these pattern matchers, and then you implement the logic that this is expressing, and you implement it in C++, Python, Ruby, Perl, Haskell, JavaScript. Uh, and then you verify that the driver matches the then expected outcome. It's pretty laborious. Maybe in Ruby, for which this tool was originally designed, it's relatively straightforward. Other languages, less so. Some languages didn't have a Ruby, uh, a Cucumber framework at all, so like C. Haskell, Go, I believe at the time, maybe still, has no Cucumber analog. And so we would have had to start writing our own Cucumber frameworks, as well as writing in 20 programming languages all of the pattern matches and all the implementations of the actual code that gets run when you match one of these patterns. So it seemed like a lot of work for the payoff. And additionally, there was just kind of a cultural rebellion against this among many of our driver authors. For Rubyists, this looked reasonable. This comes from their culture. Maybe JavaScript, Python, other sort of scripty kind of languages are open to the idea. As you start to head down the layers, though, like the cultural background of a C programmer makes this look just absurd. It just looked ridiculous. It's great for Cobalt. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just like English, right? Um, and when people just don't like something, when it's aesthetically offensive to them, no amount of 
cajoling or convincing or threatening is going to really make for a solid and enthusiastic implementation. So it was our last best hope, and it failed. And we were kind of left without a paddle. Uh, and this situation lasted for more than a year, where we were still writing specs, and we were still making a really solid effort to manually verify that everybody matched it. But we just we didn't trust that we had gotten it right, because we had no automatic way to verify compliance. But we did find a way out. We did come to the dawning of a new age. Uh, and Samantha was a big part of this, so I will turn the remote back over to her. Thank you. Let me switch with you. Yeah. So you guys all made it through that terrifying, scary cat with laser eyes, dark night. Um, and we made it through as well. And what we found at the end of this night, at the beginning of our dawn, was YAML. And our solution was to write tests for our specs in YAML. Uh, some of you might be wondering what YAML is. So first things first, what is YAML? Well, YAML is yet another markup language, except that it, it actually isn't. Um, they changed their mind about that, the creators of YAML, and they decided that YAML ain't markup language at all. Um, and the reason they did this was because they wanted YAML to be a data-oriented language and to make that really clear with the name. And what we mean by that is that it's, it's data-oriented versus meant to mark up a document or something like that. YAML is about 15 years old. Um, it was developed by a few individuals in the community. Uh, Clark Evans is one of those people. And it was based on several other programming languages that we use internally. So it was based on C, Python, Perl, and another of other things. And what this means for us, um, besides that we, as programmers coming from that language, kind of accept it as a simple language that we don't have to expend lots of effort trying to understand, like Cucumber, is it means that it does actually translate pretty readily into any of those languages. So YAML parsers are available for most languages, uh, most of the languages that we have drivers and have them. And if it's not available, uh, YAML can be really easily parsed to JSON, which is a notation that we use natively for MongoDB. So if you're writing a driver, you have to parse JSON at some level. So what we do is we actually we take our YAML tests and we convert them to JSON and we release both sets side by side. So we're hopefully covering any sort of configuration someone's using, whether they have a native YAML parser, whether they're writing a JSON parser because they need to to be a driver, they'll be able to parse these tests. We're not going to have to do lots of work trying to reinvent the wheel on parsing YAML. But apart from the kind of universability of it, um, it seems superior to a lot of our other choices. Compared to JSON, it's more human readable, and we'll get into that in a second. Compared to XML, it's just nicer. Maybe that is for clear to most people. And compared to Cucumber, it didn't provoke this kind of like really intense aesthetic reaction from people. It's more language neutral. Or maybe it's not language neutral, but it's based on a variety of languages and languages in which more of our developers program. So the majority wins out in this scenario. But there are kind of two killer features that YAML offers. Bear with me, I know configuration languages aren't exciting, but I think these features are killer. So the first killer feature of YAML is that it offers a standard comment format. And this might not seem like a big deal, but it is. So <laughs> I will explain why. Let's take some examples from our test. So here we have the setup for a server against which we want to test this latency threshold feature that Jesse was describing. So we have our little block of YAML, we have some different attributes, and we have a nice comment saying this is a primary server. 
And we have another server, and we have our comment saying this is a secondary server. And if you're at all familiar with replica sets, um, this is kind of like a master-slave relationship. Uh, it's really, it's OK if you've never seen this before. The point is, we are able to very easily say, oh, OK, this collection of lines means a server, and these are different because one is a primary and one's a secondary. So each of these um, servers has an address. It's got a round trip time. It's got a type, either primary or secondary. And then it's got some extra information to say what data center it is. We use configurations like this in many of our tests um, to specify what a mocked server should look like. So having the comments there just you know, makes it much more digestible. The second killer feature of YAML is that it's kind of programmatic. Um, so if, if any of you code, you're probably familiar with this saying, don't repeat yourself. This is kind of one of the fundamental ideas behind computer science is that we want to factor our code in such a way that we can reuse bits of information and reuse uh, bits of functionality. And I spent a lot of time kind of wondering why we use this so much in our code, but we allow our configuration languages to repeat themselves all over the place. Perhaps it's just because not that many languages of this ilk offer such a feature, but YAML does, which is pretty cool. So we have our server from before, and I've given it a name. So on the second line there under the comment, I've just called it primary server because I come up with really creative names. And we've prefaced this with an ampersand. So if you come from a language with um, the idea of a pointer, that's kind of what this is. It's saying, here's this chunk of data, and I'm going to assign a name and an address to it. So then later, when we want to reference that in our test by saying that this server, this server should be selected, we can simply reference the name. We use an asterisk, and this is kind of like saying, oh, go look up where this information is stored elsewhere in the file. And this might also seem really basic if you're used to looking at code. And it is pretty basic with code, but it's, it's like a huge leap for mankind with configuration languages. I get very excited about YAML. Mm -hmm. Anyway, this is great for a number of reasons. All the same reasons it's good to not repeat yourself in code, you can have those benefits in your data-oriented languages, too. And it just makes it more readable. Looking at this file, it's very clear that there are a list of two servers that are selected. Both of them fall within this window that we're describing. So how do we go about writing these tests and releasing them? What's the process? We write a single set of tests for spec in YAML. And then all drivers parse that spec in. So there's still some work that has to be done by each driver to write what we call a harness for parsing in the YAML tests. And at some level, this is unavoidable, this kind of duplicated work amongst drivers, because they are separate code bases, and they do have to test in separate ways. But rather than saying that every single driver author has to go implement the tests, we're just closing that gap and saying, all right, you don't have to implement the tests. You just have to parse these tests in. So a theme here that we keep coming back to is just trying to close the margin for misinterpretation. We're trying to make the work that has to be replicated as small as possible and the space for interpretation as small as possible, too. What ends up happening here, because each spec has to be, uh, each test spec has to be parsed in a certain way, is that we end up with a kind of mini language for each spec. And when we release our YAML tests, we release them with a readme file that says, the test files are structured like this. You're going to have some setup, just mock something up to match that. You're going to have an operation. Then you're going to have some output. And they describe all the, the kind of parts of a test file and how they should be translated to code. And these tend to look very similar across languages. Um, this is, a, I think, a case when people do actually go look at a reference implementation. If another language has already written harness for the YAML files, it's usually a pretty concise bit of code, and it's easy to go look at it and base your own harness off of that. So we write two kinds of tests that are included in these suites for which you have to write harnesses. And the first are unit tests. And what we mean by this is tests for a very small piece of the system, a kind of small bit of functionality. So for example, in this uh, case we're talking about the latency threshold example, you need to be able to calculate the round trip time of a server before you can decide whether you want to read from it or not. 
So we use an exponentially weighted moving average to calculate round trip time. And we have to test that somehow. So here we have a test for round trip time calculation. And we have three values. The first is the existing round trip time for a server, so how far we think it is. The next is, imagine we have a new message from that server. We have now a new time to apply to its round trip time calculation. And the last is what the new average should be once calculated, given those other two. Um, and I actually wrote this test. And I wrote this test by writing a Ruby script that implemented the spec to write the test for the spec. Because to, to spit out these numbers, it had to already implement the exponentially weighted moving average. And at some level, you kind of reach the top of this chain where you can't test your tests anymore. So what this boils down to is me sitting there with a the calculator and checking all the numbers and making sure they're right. And that's a necessary part of testing. You know, at some level, there's just, there has to be a human who comes in and reads the test and verifies that it's correct. The point is that it really should just be me sitting there with a the calculator. We shouldn't have every single driver author going to their TI-89s and plugging in numbers. Mm -hmm. Making that sort of work that has to be done, just making it as little as possible. So these unit tests for things like this, they give us certain great things. Um, the first is the ability to support test-driven development, which at MongoDB doesn't, um, we don't have a history of doing that per se, and the reason is because our product and our drivers kind of developed organically over time in this like chaotic, creative, explosion fashion, and then we step back later and are like, oh, we should standardize. Uh, so this isn't something that might help us internally so much, although sometimes it does. Uh, Jesse and I were working recently on the C driver and we just wiped out the existing implementation of this feature and started from scratch. And we were able to develop to the test and it was a really nice experience. It was able, um, we were able to benchmark ourselves as we went. Um, they kind of guided us into writing a well-structured part of the code base because we were able to you know, write these small components that are unit testable. And we didn't have to spend time going and writing tests, we just had them there, which was great. But we think this is more important for people in the community who are starting new drivers, who don't have an existing code base to work from, and who are really starting from scratch and can use these tests as a guide to help them in their implementation. Also, because of the way the tests can be structured and commented, and attached with the readme file, these tests really clearly describe those small parts of behavior in a way that wasn't really possible with our English prose descriptions. So those are unit tests. The second kind of test we write are integration tests, and this is kind of like a wall of YAML, so we can take a minute and look at that, but first let's go back to the situation that Jesse was describing, because this test is for this scenario. So again, we have a driver, We've got two servers, they're 10 and, mil 10 and 20 milliseconds away. And the idea is that we'd like to read from both and load balance between them because they're both pretty close. So back to this test, just have that little reminder. We've got our setup here on the left. We've got two servers in our replica set, primary and secondary. One is 20 milliseconds away and one is 10 milliseconds away. Then on the right, we have the operation to be performed by the test. We want to perform a read, and we want to read from the nearest server, or some of the nearest servers. The expected output, then, is that both of these servers are eligible for that read. And this is very clear. We have an array. If you were parsing this in, it would be very clear as a driver to see that there are multiple elements in the list, that the second server won't just be left behind because it's greater than 15 milliseconds away. And these kind of test more like end-to-end -end functionality of a system. And they're important because sometimes these tests can have phases of running. We'll say start out with this sort of configuration your replica set, then add a server and make sure this happens, then perform an operation, make sure it looks like this after that. So because of YAML's ability to kind of repeat bits of information, we're able to concisely express these tests. Like this test would be much longer if we had to take all of the information here and shove it in over there as well. So it's been a good fit for us so far. And this is just, again, to emphasize that this is the result that we want here. 
So the other thing that we needed these tests to be able to do, besides very rigidly explaining what the intended behavior was, is that we need them to be flexible enough to allow for differences in implementation. Because we do have all these existing drivers who aren't going to go restructure their code so it perfectly fits the structure of the test. We need to be able to have it be sort of flexible. So for example, if you had a driver written, you might hide this logic away so that the only thing you could see was the single server that was ultimately selected for the operation after load balancing happens or lack of load balancing happens. So if you had such a server, you could still make this test work you could run a number of trials of this test and keep track of which server was returned and make sure that you did get some distribution of both of these servers in that result set and that you didn't get any other servers in that result set. And we could kind of argue about the virtues of testing this way. <laughs> Can you really say that in any certain number of runs you'll get both results? These will probably be pretty flaky tests. The point is that it's possible to do it. So anybody with this feature should be able to use this test in a way to uh, test their implementation. So if you want to hear more about the kind of tests that we do, um, one of our colleagues, Emily Stalfo, recently gave a talk at our conference, MongoDB World, about our integration tests. And we'll provide a link at the end of the talk, so don't worry about writing anything down. But um, it's a great talk, and it goes into this in a bit more depth. So what does all of this mean for us, all of these new specs, all of this YAML code? Well, it means a few things. First, it's meant better communication, both internally and externally. Um, internally, we're able to communicate the functionality better, better than with English prose, people just wouldn't read to the end. But what's more important is, for external driver authors, there's this kind of whole discussion that goes into writing a spec that we have internally. That's not an open process yet, the process of actually writing the spec. And we'd like to change that because we'd like community drivers, uh, authors input on that. But what ends up happening is we discuss for months and months, we finally figure out a spec, we decide upon it, and everybody involved has a certain amount of context for that spec. But external driver authors don't. They are not privy to that conversation at all. They just find the spec one day totally complete. I'm like, where did this come from? And so we would like to change that in the future. But for now, it's a step in the right direction to at least provide the spec with a set of full tests that are themselves explanations of the behavior. So increasing our communication is good. The second thing is better implementations. Certainly more testable implementations, because now we are forcing all drivers to implement these tests. Um, also, if you are developing to the test itself, it can help guide the implementations, as I mentioned before. The third thing that we get from this, um, and Jesse kind of alluded to this, is we have a way to check whether you did it or not. We have these tests. We say run them, and if you pass, you pass. And if you don't, you have to go fix your implementation. And it's no longer up to the author of the spec to go and read 20 different implementations in 20 different languages and try to determine whether you're right or wrong. Um, and what happens when we develop and test specs is often the spec will get decided on and then we'll release it and say it's time to implement and someone will come and put their foot down and say, no, this is wrong. This isn't the way I want to do it. Even though the time for that discussion is kind of passed already, people are attached to their old implementations. They spent time on them and they don't want to change them or they have another idea of how it should work and it's probably a very valid idea of how it should work, but it's not the spec. The nice thing about YAML is that it just doesn't care. It's too bad whether you're attached to your implementation or not. YAML will tell you whether you're right or wrong. And you just have to deal with it. So that kind of accountability is something that we are very happy we have. And we're happy it doesn't have to rest on the shoulders of a spec author. It can just be this kind of faceless code that does it. Lastly, this process is encouraging more specs to be written. The process of writing a spec takes a lot of time. It's long. It can be frustrating because you're trying to get 10 different project maintainers to agree on how something should work, which is a hard problem, probably unsolvably hard. But once you do manage to finally create a spec, at least now you know that it will be implemented. And if it's not, 
we can tell who's not implementing it and force them to do so. So it makes it much more satisfying and more people are coming forward to write specs. We have a whole list of probably tens of specs that are in the works now and we only have three that exist so far. So tens is way more than three. People are clearly more excited about writing specs because they work. So the kind of takeaways from this is that we are levering this, uh, leveraging this um, technique of writing tests and finding that it's helping us in a few ways. Firstly, we're standardizing our drivers and that's good for us as a business because we sell support. We need to have an efficient support team to be able to operate as an open source company. And we need to be able to know that our users are having a pretty good experience using our product because we're based on that community. So if we can offer drivers with the same API versus wildly varying APIs, people are just going to have a better experience and we're going to do better as an open source company. We're also encouraging other authors to standardize along the same lines. We can't guarantee that we, they will. We don't have any sort of ownership over their code. But if they do, we'll have a way to know and we'll be able to promote them the same way that we can promote our own internal drivers. And this is something that is kind of like an open source standard, being able to prove that parts of your product developed by the community are just as trustworthy as parts developed um, by the company. So this is kind of our ultimate goal and this sort of testing, this testing framework brings us much closer to that goal. So if you are a community driver author, definitely come talk to us afterwards about specs or about anything else. If you'd like to be involved in that, talk to us too. Um, if you're interested in working at MongoDB, come talk to us as well. Mandatory uh, kind of plug there for open source development. Um, Otherwise, we hope that if you are working on open source projects with similar problems or similar goals, we've maybe given you some ideas of things to try. And we'll just be happy to answer any questions that you have now. Otherwise, thank you. Mm -hmm.